Hi guys, Emily from Hyperspace Props, and today I'm gonna teach you how to play traditional sabak. The goal of traditional sabak is to get to a hand total of 23 without going over. Negative 23 also counts, and negatives actually beat positives since there are less negative cards than positive cards in here. Now the deck that you need is a 76 card deck, which is different from the spike deck. The spike deck has 62 cards with equal amounts of positive and negatives, but the traditional is 76 with more positives than negatives. You have 16 negative cards and then the 60 left over are all positive and they're made up of four different suits. Coins, sabers, staves, and flasks. And this is one reason why getting a negative number, negative 23 actually beats positive 23 because it's a lot harder to get a negative winning hand out of those 16 cards versus the positive 60 cards. Now in traditional sabak, there are two pots to play with, the sabak pot and the hand pot. And before we even deal out cards, we need to play our ante, pay to play. Here's your credits, here's my credits. We'll play with increments of one, five, and 10. Keep it super simple. So we each need to pay one, credit into the sabak pot. And you only win this pot if you get pure sabak, which is 23 or negative 23. The other pot is the hand pot. This is the pot that we bet into. And it actually starts off with left of the dealer pays the blind. So I'm dealer, you're blind. So let's put one credit into the hand pot. And that starts the betting right there. So let's deal out two cards and you put played your blind. So now you can look at your cards. You actually have a 10 and a negative 15. Not good to start off with, but we can make it better. There are three rounds in Sabak. The first round is betting, which you started with this blind. The next phase is trading, which is where you want to make your hand better. And then the third phase is dice, which I'll explain in a minute. So you've started the betting phase. So now I need to call this, raise it or fold. I will call. So now that I called your blind, you have a chance to raise it now if you want but we'll just say you check. So now is the trading phase. Now what you can do with your cards is you can trade them to make them better by discarding a card and drawing a card, or you can draw a card, or you can stay and do nothing. The biggest thing is you cannot just discard. And if you want to trade cards to make your hand better, you need to discard first before drawing a new card. So because you have a negative 15 and a 10, let's have you discard the negative 15 and draw a new card. So now you have 12. Now it's my turn. I've got a really bad hand, by the way. <laughs> this is where I'm intended just to completely fold, but you don't fold yet. You only fold on betting. So I'm gonna discard and draw. Okay. And now comes the dice face. These are the dice that you see on Han Solo's ship. These are his lucky dice. And if I roll the dice and the symbols match, it's called a shift. And we discard our hand and draw a new hand. No shift, symbols do not match. Now you don't need these dice to play. You can just use regular D6s. And if the numbers match, then you have a shift. So you don't need these. So no shift there. So now we go back to betting, trading, and dice. And we keep doing betting, trading, dice, betting, trading, dice. We keep doing it infinitely until somebody on the trading round, instead of trading, calls Alderaan. And that's when they think they have the best hand and they want to call the game. The thing with the dice is that makes milking somebody harder because if you've got a really good hand, say you've got like a 22 or 23 and you know you're gonna win and you're just milking the other person for credits, you risk losing your hand to a shift. Now there is a way to combat a possible shift. During your turn, during betting or trading, you can take one of your cards and put it in the interference field face up. Now this makes it so everyone else can see what you have which is a disadvantage to you, but it also makes me kind of nervous. So 10 is not probably the best hand. I would say like 14 probably would be a really good card to reveal because if you change a card, it's really easy to get a good hand from the one card being changed. So you can reveal a card and if there's a shift, you would only discard the card that was not in the interference field. Now, a lot of people ask if you can put all of your cards in the interference field. Yeah, you can but then I will know exactly how to play with my hand. Either I know I can try and beat that hand or I should just completely fold and not give you any more of my money. So there's not much point to putting your whole hand down there unless you know you're for sure you're gonna win and there's something coming up like a dice roll that you aren't calling Alderaan yet. So let's go back to betting. It's your turn to bet and you have a 12, not the best hand, but you can bluff. You can put a lot more into the pot if you want to. 
Let's say you put two and I will call that. And now trading, you got a 12. Let's, let's actually just draw a card for you this time. Okay, you got a nine. So 19 plus two, 21. That's a pretty good hand right there. Okay, so we'll hold on to that hand for you. Now it's my turn to trade. I am gonna discard and then draw a card. And now the dice phase. No shift. Now betting phase again, and you've got 21. It's a really good hand. But if you just start betting, if you just start betting a 10 in there, I got a really good hand, so I'm just gonna fold, right? I don't wanna put any more money into that. I'm just gonna fold. So you don't wanna to bet too aggressively or else that will scare other players away. You have a good hand, you're gonna win, so you wanna milk players for it. So you can start off, you can even start off with a check saying you're not gonna bet at all and leave it up to me. If you were to check, then I would check because I've got a bad hand actually. And then, whoops, you've checked. So now there's no raising funds. So now we gotta do that again. So there's a risk of that. Or you could just bet one credit and that's where I'd be like, oh, it's only one credit. Maybe I will call that. Now, if I don't raise it, then you can't raise it because I've called your bet. The betting phase is done. Now, trading phase, you've got 21. This might be a good time to call Aldron or you could just stay. Let's say you call Aldron. You want to win this pile of ones. It's not a whole bunch of credits, but hey, it's definitely more than not and you're going to win. So you call Aldron on the trading phase. Everyone else gets to finish their trading round and I still had my turn to go. So I'm going to discard and draw. This is bad, guys. This is bad. Okay, well, now we would reveal hands. You have a 21 and I actually have negative 28. I've just gotten consistent negative cards. Apparently I didn't shuffle the deck well enough. Just constant negative cards. So I actually bomb out because I have a negative 28, which is lower than negative 23. So we'd count the credits, six, seven, eight. So I just pay one credit, we'll round up into the sabak pot. You don't win the sabak pot because you have a 21, but you win this. So you bring all these credits over. Now, if you called Alderaan with a 21, but say I had a 22 or 23, that means I would win. Because you called Alderaan and didn't win, then you actually bomb out. And you would have to pay that 10% fee into the Sabak pot. You bomb out at the end of the game when the game is called, if you have above 23, below negative 23, or a zero, or if you called Alderaan and didn't win. So those are the situations where you would bomb out. So if you start off, I started off with a negative 34. It was really bad. I started off with a negative 34, and I thought maybe I could fix my hand. That would be a bomb out if the game was called right then, but it wasn't. You could still fix your hand and <laughs> hope for a shift where you get completely new cards. That's what I was hoping for, but you won with that. So now you got those cards. We shuffle the deck again. We pay our ante to get a new hand. You're the dealer now. Deal two new cards. And now I would have to pay the blind and we start playing another hand. And you just keep going until somebody runs out of credits or decides they don't wanna lose anymore. Again, there's no end, there's no limit to rounds. Like in Spike, there's only three rounds, but in traditional, you just keep going until somebody calls the game. So in Sabak, there are only two specialty hands you have to worry about. The best hand in the game is an Idiot's Array which is a zero, two, and three. And the second best hand is actually negative 23 because negative beats positive. The third best hand is positive 23. The fourth best hand is actually a negative two and two. The negative two and two is called the fairy empress. And then the fifth best hand is a negative 22. And then the sixth is a positive 22 and it keeps going back and forth from there. So the only two specialty hands you need to worry about is the idiot's array and the fairy empress. And the fairy empress is actually really hard to get. So I wouldn't worry too much about trying to get that. If you would like to buy a traditional deck, we have lots of styles on our website, along with dice and credits and everything else you need to play. We also have printable rules so that you can have a paper copy and also tips and strategies. Thank you so much for playing. I had a blast. If you have questions, please let me know and I will answer those. Hopefully I've covered everything in the game and let's play some Sabak.